Hello everyone, I am Deb Schur, Artistic Director of Avalok Farm Music Institute, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to Made at Avalok, our new series created to celebrate the variety and excellence of the work Avalok has supported. Each event will highlight one or two pro projects and will include discussions with musicians about process, as well as recorded performances of completed work. So far, Avalok has hosted over a thousand musicians in hundreds of groups and including dozens of composers. We hope you enjoy the diversity and depth of the genre and approaches to the creative process which will be presented here. Before we begin, however, I would like to thank a few people. First, our administrative team, Mason Donovan and Jenna Hall. Second, our musical team, Hannah Collins, Mike Compitello, Catherine Dowling, who joined me in creating these events. And last, but certainly not least, Fred Tauber, without whose generosity, the vision and inspiration of Avalok would never have come to be. So, thank you for joining us uh, for this ongoing celebration of creative work made at Avalok. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Made at Avalok. I'm Hannah Collins, and we're delighted to welcome the Baroque band Acronym to this session and to kick off a beautiful evening of, of really exciting and, and uh, seldomly heard music. And we're joined today by many members of this very large ensemble, Kivi Khan Lippmann, Beth Wenstrom, Adrian Post, Paul Dwyer, Johanna Noblum, Doug Balliot, Kyle Miller, and Edward Edwin Hoisinga. Thank you all. Welcome. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's nice to Hi. see everybody. Um, we're tuning in from all over, um, all over the country and all over the, the world right now. So I will kick it to you really quickly. I think Acronym is such a unique ensemble, so exciting. Um, Kivi, would you mind introducing Acronym? What is Acronym? What do you do? Yeah, we're we're a Baroque string band. We've got violins and violas and viols and cello and bass and fiorbo and harpsichord. And our focus is on 17th century music that no one has played since the 17th century. That's what we do. That's so exciting. So I know you've had a number of album projects. How do you find this music? Like, how do you, was that, a, did you just flash me a 10? <laughs> Congratulations, 10 albums. That's really amazing. And we did five of them at Avalok. Amazing. Uh, learned yeah. this music and rehearsed it for the first time and played it, often performed it for the first time at Avalok, and then recorded it either in New Hampshire or in New York right after our residency. So how do you, how do you come across these projects? How do you find the music? How do you find the archives, the scores? You know, how, do you, how do you design a project like this? It's, it's an amazing time to be involved in early music because all of these manuscripts are just showing up uh, digitized online on the websites of these churches and libraries and museums that had them sitting in the in their in their stacks for hundreds of years and suddenly they're just online they're being digitized for us and we just grab them and copy them out into modern notation and uh, modern editions and then they're there for us it's, it's, a, it's amazing and, and you 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 all advocate for these pieces so so beautifully and um Let's start listening right away. So I think the first track we're going to listen to has some question marks, some mystery about it. Um, may possibly written by Schmelzer, possibly written by Beaver. Edwin, would you mind introducing this this first track? Uh, no, I would not mind that at all. <laughs> uh, Sonata Yukunda is is such a fun track um, for us because I think it just became one of those pieces that we all like brought something to in the rehearsal process and had all these amazing ideas. And, and uh, there was definitely some questions and comments about some of the strange notes that we would um, encounter. And we decided to just go for them and like realize that there was a ton of harmonic discovery going on, you know, hundreds of years ago, just as there is now. Um, and it's just a, a, a piece that we all really love, and it has many tiny little movements. One of the things we also love about this language is that there's so many things that flow into little tiny different um, moments and 
and, and things. So it's very exciting. And uh, there's quite a bit of Baroque dance opportunities as you're listening. So just so you know, you might not want to sit down. <laughs> That's great advice. Um, so let's listen now to this Sonata Yukunda, and it's from the, the acronym album, The Battle, The Bethel, and The Ball.
Thank you so much for sharing that. It is uh, so well described, Edwin, and, and, and just as you, as you described it, I hope people are dancing along at home. Um, you are correct, there are many opportunities and there will be many more opportunities this evening to put your dancing shoes on. Um, so we've been so lucky to, to have Acronym visit Avalok many times over the, over the years. And um, my question for, for many groups is, you know, how does your experience at Avalok differ from what you are able to do in the, the real world? You know, when you have the day at your disposal, how does Acronym like to sort of divide up your time or what, what kind of special opportunities have you been able to discover at Avalok? I'll ask you, Beth, if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, it's so, Avalok is so incredible. I mean, I, I was just thinking about so many of us attended summer festivals as students um, and the, the focus and the intensity of those festivals is so um, mind blowing and it helps you throughout the year as you continue to study. But um, as professionals, you have to do your creating and your work while dodging distractions and um, with super busy schedules. And so to, to go to Avalok and um, just to have the freedom to, to work and to be with your colleagues and focus, um, it's such an incredible gift. Um, and there's just nowhere, nowhere else you can do that as a professional. And so to have that open up for us was really, um, we got a lot out of it. Any surprising things you've learned about your, your colleagues in the process? You know, like who's the best kayaker or, you know, who can- Well, we have some ping, studies? we have some ping pong pros. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's big in the group. You have enough of a, a ensemble here to have a proper bracketed ter tournament. Yeah. And, you know, Which we have yeah. done. Yes. <laughs> well, I think, you know, Acronym has, has really stood out as a group that has been able to, you know, capitalize on the time and, and actually drive these projects from start to finish, get these albums out into the world, you know, get this music published in video and audio. Um, and Johanna, I can ask you, uh, you know, and you're, you've also done so much performing, you know, in and around Avalok as part of, of the process. Is, is, do you find that performing live concerts is part of, you know, the discovery process as you head to the, the studio? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we would love it if we could play a program, you know, 10 times in a row before recording it, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. And there's this really special focus, like Beth was saying about, about being in, first of all, all in one place with no distractions aside from working and of course eating the food at Avalok is very important. Um, and, you know, maybe a little bit of Frisbee and a little bit of ping pong, a little bit of kayaking, but um, the hours in the day are just so much richer when you're in a place like that. And I think, I think we really, delve into the music and 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 learn it in a way that we can't in any other context like more intensely um so we have done uh several times actually we've performed on the electric earth series in new hampshire which um is a local series that presents concerts in the in the area um it's a special thing for me because i actually grew up about an hour from avalok and and some of the uh venues that we performed our concerts at our places that I knew as a child. So that's been kind of fun to revisit um, and see some old uh, family friends and that kind of thing. But um, it's a really beautiful community that just loves having this, this output of chamber music. I know other ensembles do that too, sometimes perform on electric earth. Um, and that's been a great opportunity, a way to kind of take some of the ideas that we had in the rehearsal room, um, and see how they feel in the moment and kind of unexpected things happen in a concert that you wouldn't necessarily be putting into a recording otherwise. So that's been really great. That's great. Well, we're gonna reach back into the acronym archives right now and, and, and look back at one of these concerts that you're describing. Kivi, would you mind introducing the next video? This is uh, from, I think our third concert ever. Uh, we, uh, performed our first concert in 2014. This is 2015 uh, from our third album, uh, which was an all Valentini program of sonatas and canzonas. And this was uh, on the Electric Earth series uh, from Francistown, New Hampshire. Uh, this is a Valentini chromatic canzona uh, in six parts. Let's listen.
such a beautiful piece. Um, in this in this piece, you know, we I'm going to ask Kyle and Adrian to weigh in here. You two started this Valentini track that we just listened to, and you know, for a lot of our listeners who are really familiar with string quartets, you know, hearing a, a violinist and a violist sort of get a a can in or a fugue going, and then hearing the upper voice and the lower voice come in is is something we're we're used to hearing. But in you know the acronym setting, then there are more bass voices and there are more upper voices, which is a really fun um, feature, and and you know it really puts the string quartet into a new context of what came before it. And I was just wondering, you know, four of the members of acronym, Adrian, Paul, Johanna, and Kyle play in a string quartet, the Diderot Quartet. Um, and, and how do you feel about, you know, the comparisons and, and the contrast between playing, you know, with just four or doing these six part and eight part uh, canons and sonatas? Adrian? Yeah, it's really fun to have a sort of collapsible, expandable uh, format in this group. And all of us are used to playing together in, you know, really small settings where it's just a couple of us or a string quartet. And then, you know, having the, the big band come crashing in is is so exciting. Um, in this particular one, you know, having the small forces uh, feeling, we're also trying to channel our gamba articulation as upper string players that could be playing these parts on gamba. So that was one thing we talked about a lot. Um, and yeah, it's really fun to be able to play with all of these amazing friends and colleagues in different ways within one group, within the setting of one ensemble. Um, so that's something I always really enjoy when suddenly the focus goes small uh, for a little while. Um, so I, I don't know. How about you, Kyle? How do you, what, what are your sort of thoughts about comparing later, you know, 18th, 19th century quartet playing to this early music? Yeah, I think um, I think those two kinds of music definitely have an overlap of the same kind of thrill of just um, enjoying that experience with with your friends. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest differences uh, between those kinds of music is uh, the basso continuo section, which um, we get for our acronym projects, and is this just kind of unbelievable like like a uh, font of energy just coming from below uh, this base team uh, who are all improvising like mad and doing really creative things uh, beneath you. And of course, uh, in, you know, when we're playing in our string quartet, Paul is laying down some amazing bass lines, but um, to have that full section with, with keyboard and theorbo and gamba and cello and everything all together, um, I think that is, is a, a very different experience. Was that Paul? <laughs> hey, I was going to say all of that. <laughs> yeah, for, Sorry. Me, for me as a cellist, um, you know, Tito String Quartet and Acronym are my two favorite groups where I'm really uh, hopefully an essential member of them. Um, and I love both of them. I love playing in both of them. As, as Kyle mentioned, you know, in, in a string quartet, especially because we naturally gravitate towards later repertoire, everyone's really holding their own at every moment. And of course, that's true in acronym too, but acronym, I love being part of this basso continuo section. And there's sometimes as many as five of us essentially playing from the same line. And um, there's just this really great team feeling, even if like a lot of the time we're doing, doing totally different things, they're all based on the same, the same notes and chords and progressions. Oh, and, um, there's just this great spirit of energy coming from that and in baroque music everything just emanates from from that bass energy. i think in all music as a cellist i would just Absolutely. posit that that might be true <laughs> i'm just kidding um, well let's watch this next video and then we can talk more about the sort of instrumentation choices that you've made so the next one is this samuel capricornus sonata age is that right um adrian do you mind describing a little bit more about this piece Sure. Um, the beginning of this of this particular piece has um, a really kind of uniform moment where everyone is totally together rhythmically, uh, which I think is so cool and beautiful, um, and also really challenging in its simplicity. 
um, just to find exactly the right feel for that um, and tempo. And I, I also love the end of it uh, with the cascading um, lines that just keep coming down and, and are really beautiful and sweet. For me, this, this has a very touching ending as well. It's a very kind of, um, yeah, very sweet and um, unlike many of our endings, which are kind of bombastic, it just kind of sighs like a, like a nice hug. So I love this piece for that reason. I feel like no greater representation of that description than a puppy in, the, <laughs> in Edwin's box there. Um, <laughs> great. This is another, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Electric Earth performance from 2015 in, in Jaffrey. So let's listen.
fabulous performance. I love all the virtuosity that you just see rifling from person to person to person. Um, it's such an uh, exceptional thing about acronym that any one of you could completely destroy a solo concerto or sonata, but that, then to have that as a full ensemble is is such an ex just thrilling thing. So thank you for sharing that performance. Um, I want to pick back up the conversation we were starting to have about the continuo line and, and this description of, of piling on four or five different instruments onto the, 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 the bass line. Um, maybe, Doug, I can, I can go to you. You know, when you're performing an acronym, what instruments might you be playing? Um, what, what attitude do you have since you, like we were just mentioning, you, you aren't alone down there on the ba bottom line. You have this opportunity to, to try out other colors. What, what's your position in this group? Sure. Well, maybe I can give you a little tour of our continuo section. As we've just been talking about, everybody on the continuo line is reading the same line of music, um, a bass line, either with figures or numbers that indicate the harmony or without them. And so we have a keyboard player playing harpsichord and organ. He's improvising on those harmonies. We have a theorbo player, which is like the giant bass lute with the extra long bass strings, also improvising on the harmonies. Sometimes we will have what's called a lirone, which is sort of a cello sized instrument, but with what, something like 14 or 15 strings. Um, also uh, realizing the harmonies, very celestial instrument, difficult to play, but so beautiful. Um, and then you've got the cello and the viola da gamba more traditionally playing the written bass line. And I play violone, which is sort of the gigantic viola da gamba. And what's fun about our job on the uh, written bass line is um, we too can improvise a little bit. We can ornament like the violins are doing. And I really want to emphasize that there's ornamentation and improvisation happening throughout the group. That's very clear if you look at the score while we're playing. Uh, but we can also have fun orchestrating, and as the bass player, the 16 foot, as we call it, meaning the notes I play sound an octave lower than written, where I come in and where I leave out when I'm playing pizzicato, when I'm playing arco, these can all change the gravity of the piece and the feeling of a moment. So I think really carefully about if I even should be playing and how I should be playing and where to come in and out in questions like this. And that's a really satisfying job, even if it's, um, you know, less obvious as you're listening uh, that, it, it, that there's a lot of decisions being made. So Continuo is like uh, the greatest circus of all time. And I think you really hear that in this Rosenmuller track with the great Jesse Blumberg that is coming up next. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be listening to a recording of the yeah, fa fabulous baritone Jesse Blumberg. And, and I'm excited for this next video because what you'll see is is actually the score um, as as we're listening and you know it, if you are watching how little the score is changing but hearing how the colors are just changing dramatically from section to section it really illustrates your point um, maybe Kivi or Paul or anyone how do you as an ensemble make those decisions together is it sort of like a blank canvas and people throw ideas at it and you see what works or does someone come in with a conception of what might work or do you have a sort of house style? Well, how does acronym handle those kinds of decisions? It's sort of a wild improv at first and we, we often settle into a, um, into a consensus uh, and sometimes we, uh, things get just blown apart. Someone comes up with a crazy idea and and it just turns into this, uh, it's this, it's this romp of continual noise. And a lot um, of, I think if, if you were ever to go, I hope many of you will or have had the chance to go to more than one acronym concert and hear one piece two different times, you'll notice immediately that each performance is completely different, um, even of the same piece. You'll never hear the same piece played twice the same, unless you listen to a recording. Uh, and one of our only rules in the group is that every idea should be tried out, as, cra as crazy as it seems. And some of the things we love best are the ones that we initially thought, no way is this going to work. And even sometimes when a guest joins us, 
they ca comment on sort of the chaotic democracy of our group. And the people said, I, I didn't think it was gonna work on day one of the project, but I was really surprised that you guys really make this radical democracy work. And that's very important to us. So as we turn to this Rosen Miller piece specifically, um, is there anything that we can point out? I'm thinking of a few moments, you know, where the instrumentation changes dramatically um, is there anything about it that we should prepare our audiences to hear? Kibby, maybe I'll ask you. I just, I just want to say that we have been spoiled to death by getting to work with some of the, the best singers in the world. And um, Bera Hunk, Jesse Blumberg is, uh, is just amazing. Um, and he brought so much to this. Um, and the, the continuos interacting with him in all sorts of wild ways. The, there's really interesting writing in this one that the uh, the violas don't get used until about halfway through the piece, and then suddenly they enter in this um, this instrumental ritornello. Um, you'll hear some uh, some shimmery, silvery tinkling of the lirone in the background in certain places. Um, Doug does this wild like bass like run down into this like this huge, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a, a yawp of like, I, of energy. It's, it's a really cool piece. And yeah, I'm, I, I feel very blessed to have gotten to do it with, with all of you. Well, we're lucky to hear it. Let's, let's listen.
track of the acronym playlist and we'll be we'll be listening to one final piece as we we go on to the second part of the program but i i just wanted to thank you all for being here of course and um how can people find more of your music you've mentioned that you made uh 10 albums five of which were avalok was involved where can people find these albums what what can you tell us about what's coming up or or what's been happening lately Kivy, should we start with you? Sure. Well, we've got a new disc that just came out uh, a few weeks ago uh, called Cantica Absoleta. We've got uh, four amazing singers um, and 12 uh, never, before, for, never before heard pieces from the Dubin collection uh, in uh, Uppsala, Sweden. Um, but yeah, 10 discs in all. You can buy them anywhere that you can still buy CDs. Um, the discs make great coasters and like yeah some there's some really super cool repertoire we're going to put links into the description below this video to the acronym website to other album pages and things like that so definitely have a look down there if you're looking for a chance to listen and of course um, the videos that we're sharing now will be on youtube so you can always listen to them there um, as a last 
segue here, we would love to ask you about um, a project that you did a number of years ago in collaboration with Le Canage Chantant, who will be on the next part of this program. So we're going to listen to track from that project. And then, like magic, all of you will vanish and Le Canage Chantant will appear. Um, but, but could you describe to us a little bit about that, that joint project? Yeah, we had just recorded this Valentini instrumental disc of Sonatas and Canzonas. Um, but there's a ton more uh, never before heard music by Giovanni Valentini, who was, wasn't just some random composer. This was the Hofkapellmeister of the Holy Roman Empire for about 25 years. Um, and that included some secular works and some sacred works. And so we created this project with uh, Le Canard Chantant of a completely unrecorded book of madrigals, 18 madrigals uh, written from uh, the 16 teens and uh, just really cool stuff with all with uh, continuo uh, with anywhere between four and six singers uh, and sometimes with violins and violas. Uh, Doug wasn't available so I got to play bass. That was really cool. Uh, really fun project. That's great. So we're going to listen to uh, uh, Gera Gera from this album, and then we'll come back with Le Canard Chantant. But thank you all for being here. It's been wonderful to talk with you, and we look forward to having you back at Avalok as soon as we can. I hope you, I trust that acronym has a, a lot of ideas bubbling up in the pipeline. So we'll look forward to seeing over the next years and decades, all of those next 10 albums coming out. Thank, Thank you, Hannah. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Woo, Avalok. Thanks, so Thanks Avalok. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second half of this Made at Avalok program. We were just listening to Gera Gera, an, a track from the uh, album that our two guest ensembles tonight collaborated on at Avalok, acronym and Les Canard Chantant. And now here we have a new panel of fabulous musicians to tell us a little bit more about Les Canard Chantant's work. Um, and we'll, we'll continue talking about the Valentini in a moment, but first let me introduce uh, the co-directors of Les Canards Chantants, Robin and Graham Beer. We have Jacob Perry, Eric Brenner, and the guest artist Richard Wistreich. Is that right, Richard? That's correct. Uh, joining us today to tell us a little bit more about, about Les Canards Chantants. So first let's start out by asking Robin and Graham, if I may, What's the story behind this wonderful name? And, and <laughs> what is a capture about this group? What is your group's mission? Sure. Well, uh, we formed this ensemble actually when the two of us were pursuing master's degrees in early music in England and um, at the University of York, if anyone's keeping track. And we formed this ensemble. We needed a name, wanted it to be connected to the university, but wanted something more interesting than, you know, uh, the York Voices or the University of York Ensemble or Consort This or That. Um, and the unofficial mascot of the university is the duck. And uh, I'll, I'll save you the lengthy brainstorm and discussion, but um, we're an ensemble that is quite theatrical, quite silly sometimes. And um, so we, we came up at one point with uh, the idea of the singing ducks, but then that sounded a bit a bit too full on. So we, we thought, well, how does it sound in this language or that, you know, and in German, it was, it rhymed too much. And in, in uh, Italian and Latin, it sounded a bit rude, um, but French sounded great, les canards chantants. So we ran with it. So that's, that's the name. Um, maybe I'll let Graham talk about the, the ethos of the group a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, we, we love singing one to a part. It's sort of the, the string quartet approach to singing. So we get the best of both worlds, the choral singing and the soloistic approach. Um, so we are a sort of flexible membership ensemble. It certainly helps if you've got the best singers. Uh, so we've got wonderful singers who can sing in a wide range and take on a bunch of different approaches to the singing. But um, yeah, what we're looking to do is to sort of have that string quartet feel through early music. So one person do a part and depending on the music we're doing, we need different lineups with the group. So we've got a bit of a flexible membership in that right. And we'll explore anything that was written one to a part, which is, um, and, and then some things that weren't as well and, and try to take that approach to it as a new insight into the way the music works. Well, we, call yeah. we call ourselves a solo voice ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're not a choir. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of the e virtuosi approach that yeah, yeah, some yeah. instrumental ensembles go. I imagine that's sort of both a challenge, but also really um, kind of thrilling and exciting opportunity. You know, if we turn back to this Valentini project that unlike a string quartet where you can play, you know, centuries worth of music for that, that format that you have to assemble a specific group of, of vocalists and musicians for each particular project. So Mm -hmm. Was there anything about this Valentini project, you know, that you remember about how you draw, you drew that particular line up together? Yeah, that's a, a great question and a fun one. So um, this Valentini collaboration came up actually um, because I and one of Acronym's um, main instigators, Kivi Khan Lippmann, were together on a retreat for an entirely different ensemble. Um, but reading through lots of repertoire and, and, and one morning, you know, over coffee, he said, hey, come take a look at this, this book of madrigals I found. It's really interesting. And uh, he was thinking about the idea of recording it and said, but we need a group of singers. And so I went, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> us please. Um, but I t when I started taking a closer look at this book of madrigals, um, it quickly became apparent that if we wanted to record the whole collection, we were going to need to be very flexible indeed. Um, there are 18 madrigals in the collection and the first 13 are just for voices and continuo. Uh, continuo, you know, could be just a baseline instrument or a collection of pluckers and bass lines, um, but no solo instruments. And, and then the, uh, the rest of the book, madrigals 14 through 18, suddenly add solo instruments into the mix. So it's a huge band. 
And then just looking at the singers, um, we had music for four voices, five voices, six, and up to eight, eight singers in one madrigal. So we needed a big lineup. Uh, and then within that, Valentini wrote, um, his writing was very virtuosic and placed surprising demands on each individual voice type. Um, so for instance, uh, some of the madrigals were written for a fairly normal looking bass voice in terms of the range and the expectations, but a few of them had extraordinary low notes. Um, Lo you know, lower than I can go by a long <laughs> shot. <laughs> uh, very low notes combined with uh, some really agile coloratura, um, which is not something that the average bass singer today is really necessarily equipped to handle those two things at once. Um, there are also some madrigals that had very wide ranging alto lines um, that, you know, on one page, it looks like a high tenor part on the next, it looks like a proper alto part, you know, you need someone who can handle that. Uh, and then there were a few madrigals that demanded um, okay. a voice that you couldn't really tell if it was a tenor or a bass, mostly tenor tessitura, but occasionally going down to bottom G, things like this. So. Um, we were looking at these scores and scratching our heads thinking, right, so we need some really unusual voices to complete this lineup. And um, that's how we ended up. We had our, our core six, which was Jacob Perry, tenor, who's here, Eric Brenner, countertenor, who sings soprano for us. Myself, I'm an alto, Graham is a bass. We also had Molly Netter, soprano, and Owen McIntosh, tenor. Um, they're not with us today. But we, we also ended up inviting Jesse Bloomberg, who is a, a bass baritone with a very uh, flexible high range to sing those unusual baritone parts. And we invited Richard Wistrike um, bass to join us as well um, because he has particular experience with these kind of super agile, very low 17th century bass vocal lines. And that was our team to tackle Valentini. Sounds like the vocal equivalent of like the Avengers or something. Everyone can only come to rehearsal if you have a superpower. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Well, that's a great segue to, to just asking Richard, you know, what was your experience like joining this team for this project and, and coming to Avalok to work on it? Well, first of all, um, well, the first thing that I, I should point out is that I was incredibly delighted to be invited for two very strong reasons. The first of all, I had been dreaming of performing these very madrigals for at least 20 years. I have a long history because I am, the second point is that I am twice as old as all these guys. <laughs> and I was kind of totally blown away that they should invite somebody who's effectively a has-been from the, the madrigal singing period, you know, going back to the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but my dream of performing Valentini um, kind of almost came true uh, in the 1990s. I had a, my own ensemble in, in UK called Red Bird. And uh, when the madrigals were first edited by, by an editor from the original part books, they approached us to see whether we could, um, we could put together an ensemble for it. And we tried and tried, but in the end, we just could not get together the right people at the right time in the right place um, with the right conditions. So the project kind of died the death. And then one day I got out of the blue this amazing email from Robin. Um, and I met, first met Robin and Graham when they were studying for their master's degrees at York University in England, because I was also doing some teaching there. So we had a little bit of a connection and not that we'd actually, I don't think we'd ever sung together. So it was a kind of big leap of faith on their part, I have to say. Um, so I, I don't know how much I've ever revealed to them, but I spent the year between being invited and actually arriving in Avalok for the first rehearsal, leaping between thrilling excitement and absolute terror that I had committed <laughs> myself to this completely, let's face it, ridiculous piece of writing <laughs> for the bass. <laughs> The last, the last thing I should say is that I have a kind of second life. I'm not, not just singing, but I'm also a musicologist and I specialize in this period. And it's interesting that, that Valentini wrote this music actually not for a group of um, people with superpowers. Well, they, they were quite good, but it was a standing ensemble, in fact, at the court of Vienna. And all those musicians were on, were on tap. 
So he just wrote for the people he knew. Now, the big change is that these days, nobody has the money to hold together ensembles like that permanently to put at the, uh, at the disposal of, of composers. So this was a, in every way, a kind of groundbreaking project. So I, I was completely excited to be part of it. Well, we better start listening to some of these, <laughs> some of these recordings. So we'll, we'll turn now to, to a recording from this album. Um, well, we've already heard one track, but we'll go to the next. Uh, would you like to introduce it, Robin? Sure. Um, so this is number five from the book, um, which is in the Continua Magical section. So you won't hear any of the solo violins or violas that you had in Guerra, Guerra. Um, this is Ridete Pur, Ridete. And um, the text is really quite simple. Um, there's a single soprano voice in this madrigal sung by Molly, um, who simply repeats over and over, ridete pur, ridete, which means laugh then, laugh. And the two tenors and the bass are in the meantime extolling the virtues of this laughing girl, describing her beautiful uh, sparkling eyes and um, her smile and things like that. So it's a fairly simple, sweet little poem, but it does have these wonderful uh, coloratura lines from the bass and the tenor voices. This is four voices, continua magical. Ridete. All right, let's listen. <laughs> Guanciardenti, o vi fiocchi lucenti, o vi fiocchi lucenti, così rido le rose, così rido le rose, delle norsie più brose, così lucide belle, così lucide belle, rido nel cielo. Così lucide e belle, così lucide e belle, rido nel cielo e stelle. Ridete pur, ridete donna, che col bel riso aprite il Ridete, 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 
sharing that such a delightful piece i'm definitely going to be repeating listening to some of these tracks over and over again after learning about them um i wanted to invite eric and jacob into the discussion here you know uh, as we mentioned the the lineup for les canards chantant is a really stellar group of musicians and i know that the two of you are performing with all sorts of different ensembles um, and i've heard you perform with other ensembles I wonder what it's like mentally for you to enter in a project like this where you know there is very little prior work done, maybe no prior recording of the work you're working on compared to when you have to do a, something like the Messiah or you know a Bach cantata for which people in the audience are very well versed on what they're about to hear. Does it change your mentality about uh, interpreting or about your approach at all? Maybe Eric, we can start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I, I was just thinking when, when you were talking about Messiah and, and each Christmas time, uh, we'll get into these various rooms with these various people where, where we're doing this same familiar song. And very often someone, one of the conductors will, will say, will remind us. So a lot of the people in the audience have never heard this song before. Make it, make it new for them. And so that can be, uh, it, obviously it's, it's comforting and it and it's, can be easier to sing a song that's familiar and that you, you, know, you know your notes, you know the, the words, um, but you can also get lazy and you can get a little bored. And so keeping it invigorated um, is an important challenge. And so with something like this, there's no choice but to be completely invigorated and a little bit frightened and a little bit daunted, but but man, for for me, uh, I've had a few opportunities in my career to to, I mean, with new music as well, but also with with old music newly discovered, to 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 put your stamp on on something that hasn't been heard in centuries, and to say, well, there's no definitive way to do it. Let's do a definitive way. Let's let's figure out what we want to say with this piece. Let's figure out, hey, it wants to go a little faster or a little bit slower. Let's talk about Fichte or never, ever, ever talk about Fichte. <laughs> uh, all the things. Sure. Jacob, did you have some thoughts about that as well? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with, with all of that. Um, I think it, there's a great deal of freedom in that. And I think we had a lot of time um, affordable, not a lot of time considering the just sheer amount of repertoire that we that we had to get through in the in the period of time we uh, set aside to do it. We we had quite our our a bit of work cut out for us, um, but it was a, a romp the entire time. Uh, an incredible joy for me as a very um, relatively inexperienced uh, singer at the time. Um, I had my eyes just wide open the entire time uh, in wonder um, around such fantastic colleagues, but also people that could show me how to find how I encounter this music, how I can bring this text to life, um, and how that there are rules um, to this music. And it's a very academic thing. When we think about early music, we think about the structure and the rules and historical um, performance practice. And then there's an element of they were people. So we are people too, right? So we can figure out what will make this relevant to our audience is what will, is what will have made it relevant to theirs. And discovering that together uh, was one of the most rewarding experiences ever. That's a wonderful answer. It, it strikes me about, you know, the madrigal texts are often so vivid, either catching a certain moment or a certain emotion, or some of them are more of a kind of like a narrative journey, but there is this sort of feeling that they're being sung to someone, right? So you were guiding, guiding your listener through this sequence, and that's been the same for all these centuries. Um, we're about to listen to maybe one of the more, um, you've all referred to as epic uh, 
selections from, from the volume here, and Jacob, I'll turn to you again maybe to start to introduce this, but certainly it's one of the longest pieces in, on the album and, and sort of one of the, the uh, biggest journeys to construct. Can you Absolutely. tell us about it? Sure. Um, well, it is, in, it is one of the longer, more uh, elaborate pieces, not in terms of the um, voicing necessarily, because I believe it's only five, is it five voices? Um, but it's got three major parts, um, and the text is very much like a soliloquy, um, a, a crying out in anguish about sort of feeling like you were done with the pain of past love and the burn from that um, and going through, it has what every great piece of musical theater, I know, in my opinion, should have, which is you end up in a different place from where you started and you have uh, a sort of journey with, with the speaker, um, beginning speaking, uh, extinguished in my heart were the old flames and from so long ago and continuous war from my enemy I was hoping for peace and then by the third part we're back to right back into the thick and the throes of love again oh cruel stars now give me peace and it's one of the most um epic and 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 um fantastic parts of the piece and I, I can't wait for you all to hear it <laughs> I can't wait to hear it again it was amazing <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to just underline a teeny bit the, what, what Jacob was saying at the end there. It's a long piece, it's epic, and our attention spans are a little short sometimes, but, but we maybe have some extra time on our hands these days. Please, please, if you haven't heard this piece before, or even if you had, or if, if you have, stick around for part three, because holy, holy cow, holy cow, that's it. It's worth it. <laughs> Well, we better get started. So let's listen to, to this track. And this is the Spente Eran, from right. the second book of Madrigals by Valentini. Thank you. 
journey, maybe a little bit more heartbroken than we were when we started it. Um, thank you again for sharing that. And I, I wanted to ask Richard again, just while you were at Avalok, did you find anything 
um, unusual or particularly notable about the way that you were able to work together? I think different groups have sort of different ways of, of finding ways to be creative and, and productive in that space. What was Le Canard Chantant's version during this, yeah, during this project? Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, at the risk again of sounding um, like um, the old boar at the bar. I mean, I've been, I've been in the magical singing business for, I would say more than 40 years. And if I, if I can, one thing I've learned is that to do it well, you need a very, very special kind of peace and quiet and in attention and in inten intensiveness between the people. You have to build an incredible trust. You have to take risks together. And to do that, you, the last thing you need to do is to be under the pressure of the stress and time constraints of trying to put a, a show on the road very quickly. One of the wonderful things about coming to Avalok was, I mean, I won't even go into all the legendary qualities about it, the peace and quiet, the beautiful boating on the lake and the amazing eating and all those kinds of things, because I'm sure people will talk about those. For me, the really key thing there was that we had a lot of time together where there were no distractions. We made distractions outside the time. When there was no distractions, the kind of quality of that together working was just, um, was quite sensational. I mean, for me, it was very revelatory. I mean, I, I have worked with a lot of different ensembles over my long career, but this ensemble had a combined this huge focus with, and as something that, 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 that Eric brought up, this, this, this ability to be playful, which I think is incredibly unusual these days where everyone's always trying to get perfection. And the thing is perfection comes out, first of all, out of the energy of being playful and being um, trusting of everybody who's there. So I, I have to say Avalok was the ideal um, atmosphere to do that work in. Um, I, I will never forget it for the rest of my life. It was a real high point. It's so beautiful to hear about and I think um, one thing that I've heard both Acronym and Les Canards Chantants sp speak about is just to, to assemble the six or the eight or the 11 people in the first place is a minor miracle, but for this Valentini project to have both groups, both there and able to do it seemed like, you know, a once in a lifetime type of uh, lining up of the stars, so to speak. But were there any other surprises that you learned about each other or about acronym while you were collaborating together? I, I did have one. I, I, uh, I, I've been around, uh, in the in the scene, maybe a maybe a decade or two less than than Richard has, but I've been around a little while. Um, I've I've had the incredible honor and luck to work with some incredible uh, instrumental ensembles for early music all around the world, and I have to say that of all of them, Acronym is by far the best set of ping pong players I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> True. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> we did not stand a chance against them. <laughs> so embarrassing. Oh, so humiliating. Oh, oh. So now we know what they were doing while you were all rehearsing. Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I might say that, if I might add, that, that although they were fabulous players, I think the parts that Valentini wrote for the, the, the instrumentalists are nothing like as difficult as the parts he wrote for the singers. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Spoken <laughs> like a singer. They did have some time on <laughs> That's to even out the, the ping pong balance there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, this last, this last magical that we just listened to, I know you've, you've used in other projects because it's such a favorite. And we've been lucky enough to have Le Canard Chantant come to Avalok more than once. And I would love to talk to you a little bit more about um, the next project that you did, Sex, Drugs, and Madrigals, very evocative title. So I'll throw it back to Robin and Graham maybe to describe how that project came about and how, how the programming idea came together for that project. Yeah, well, we like to, uh, 
we love this music so much. And, um, but it's a bit of a niche thing, early music within its own little crowd. We're trying to grow it to, pe people need to hear this music. Um, and it's just easy for us to get together and sing the music because we love it. But in terms of trying to reach our audience, we're always interested in coming up with programming ideas that, that sort of have a thread or a catch that might make it relevant in one way or another. Um, and this particular program was based on the idea of, um, of how provocative these pieces were seen to be, particularly by members of the church or something like that. Uh, if I may, <clears throat> I'm, I would like to share uh, a quote with you from 1589, to sort of right smack in the middle of the, the, the pieces that we programmed for Sex, Drugs, and Madrigals, that gives you a sense of how the madrigal genre was viewed uh, at the time, and this might be you and I. We should I just say that we have an we have an off-screen uh, member, future member of Lake and Archer, yeah, yeah, yeah. singing along. But please do share this quote. All right. Um, so here it is. This will give you a sense of our inspiration here. Often the the ears of youths are delighted by music, which softens the heart to every lasciviousness, ruins good behavior, dispels honesty inflames the soul with burning love and stimulates the mind to carnal desire. The lute is strummed to an amorous battle piece. One is inadvertently invited to balls and dances where sensations go spinning, kisses become too loving, words too secret. Hands are clasped in hiding and sometimes one is led away to dark places, to shameful and outrageous actions. And you know, there's another time in history that we've heard that a little bit more recently. This is from the 1950s, the Reverend Jimmy Snow. These men come down here from New York and from Florida to find out on my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. And I 100% believe it. And why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. <laughs> so uh, we obviously, you know, singing madrigals is sort of the, the, the peak of our music, my, my musical experience at least. I think I, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but it is such uh, an incredibly emotional journey and it can be playful and it can be sexy and it can be tragic. And um, we really wanted to try and get that amazing emotional variety across to our audience. Um, and that is sort of where the idea of sex, drugs, and madrigals was, was born. So we, we created a program that isn't just a sort of a park and bark concert, if you will, um, but more of a theatrical exploration. Uh, and we brought together some of our, our favorite madrigals from a wide variety of composers, but we looked at each one and, and tried to ask ourselves, how do we get this piece to come across to a 20th or 21st century audience the way that it might have back in the 1500s? And so some of these pieces we simply performed, but some of them we staged in various ways. Uh, you know, memorized and, and staged. And, um, and even within those stagings, we had a wide variety of approaches to each piece. And the end result was kind of a, a seamless performance um, where sometimes we were behind music stands and sometimes we very much were not. And some pieces we took a very um, lighthearted approach to them, comedic, others were, were again more intense. And uh, a program like that is not one that is easy to put together when you're rehearsing on the clock in the, in the normal world. So um, it's a program we pioneered before we came to Avalok for the first time, before we came to do the Valentini, but we came back to Avalok in order to carve out some time and space for ourselves to really explore this music and explore the idea and take more risks with it and come out the other side with really quite an unusual magical 
performance. Well, let's listen to an example from the program now, and then we can come back and talk a little bit more about the creative process. So there's, sure. I believe you're about to share one selection from this program. Yeah, this is a piece by Carlo Gesualdo, who is a, a well-known name um, within the Italian madrigal genre. He was, he was famous for having had quite a shocking personal life and for writing music that breaks a lot of chromatic rules. Um, so it's quite exciting music to start with. And uh, this particular magical is called Ashugate Beyoki, Dry Your Beautiful Eyes. And um, we actually discovered this piece while we were at Avalok. We were reading through lots and lots of repertoire, trying to find the pieces that really spoke to us. And this was one that we fell in love with immediately. And um, one of the wonderful things about being at Avalok is not just a chance to work together, but also to share what you're doing with the other people who are there. So we performed this at one of the after dinner sort of show and tell concerts uh, in the dining hall. And we're gonna share with you that first performance um, of this Ashugate. All right, here it is. Oh.
So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the rehearsal process for this sex, drugs, and, and, and madrigals. I keep wanting to say rock and roll. <laughs> you almost got, almost got <laughs> That's there. the point exactly. <laughs> I mean, Jacob, you mentioned, or you made a reference earlier to, to musical theater, and I'm just wondering how the rehearsal process of kind of discovering the staging for these, or, you know, how, how did it work for you? Is it a brainstorming process, an experimental process, or a, how did you um, handle that? It, I think it depended on, on, on a piece to by piece basis, there was more or less of an outline um, from Robin and Graham ahead of time of sort of the general goal of what the concept behind the staging because some of them are very um conceptual uh and involve props that just sort of illustrate some of the things in a long list that's in the madrigal like a, one of the very uh gabrielli pieces that we um have performed on many different iterations of this and i believe we have a clip of us singing that um out on the lake at avalok for a little bit later. And some of them are more narrative and involve actual characters and roles that we play. Um, and those are just fun to get on the floor sometimes and get your hands dirty and um, get playful. Uh, Richard said earlier that Avalok is such a unique place for a lack of distraction and you can make your own distractions. And I think that's really what we had an opportunity to do, um, particularly in the rehearsal rooms that are set up just basically as uh, adult playgrounds for, for people like us. And I think we utilized it uh, very well. <laughs> Eric, I, I hear from a lot of ensembles, you know, if you're based in New York, for example, you know, that you take the subway and you show up at rehearsal and you have your 2.5 hours to get the material learned and then everyone disperses immediately. But we hear again and again from different ensembles that it was you know, over a piece of gingerbread cake that this idea came in or sitting on the porch or, you know, during down times that sometimes the most creative ideas come. Did your group experience anything like that? I mean, yeah, that, there's, there's nothing like, there's nothing like having time to, to live with the music and to live with each other. Um, couldn't ask for a more live with a bowl set of friends and and musicians to 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 sing and play and eat with the number of times that that we would be you know coming from a rehearsal that went 20 minutes over because we couldn't stop and then running over to the dining hall and wolfing down all the amazing food and continuing to talk and pull out our scores and run from table to table because, you know, maybe the Sopranos needed a break from each other, but everyone else was sitting together and just trying to, trying to figure out who we had to talk to about this idea that, that we just thought of. And if we don't talk about it right now, we're going to forget it. And we have to convince Robin before Graham tells her not to. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was thrill and, and it is, it's, it's super fun. It's, it's super playful. But boy, it's all within the context of this work at the highest possible level. And, and without that, without that, it's nothing. Without that, it's, it's just shtick. If, if, you can, if you can get a laugh out of the audience and get tears from them in the very next moment, um, and if you can be in that place yourself as a performer, laughing and crying and, and really being present to both of those and to each other on stage, that's just the best. Well, we're, we're gonna share a couple little uh, clips of you all at Avalok, including the boating video you mentioned. And one of probably the piece of uh, footage that has been viewed by the most people um, that was shot at Avalok, which uh, is the Picardy Bomb video. Um, and Graham, can I ask you to sort of give us some context for what's happening in that video? Sure. I think its attractiveness is just how much of a good in-joke it is if you study a little bit of music. Um, full credit to our soprano, who's not here on this talk with us today, Molly Netter, came up with this idea, like a photobomb, where you come in at the end of a sad piece in the minor key, and you sing a note that, that just flips it on its head and makes it major. Uh, it's so annoying. And people do this now and then in, in choir rehearsals. So it's, it seems to have found a real following among people who know someone who's done it or have had the temptation to do it themselves in a rehearsal. Um, yeah, so we, we decided we were going to fool around with that. And uh, 
filmed a couple just to put up on social media for fun and to share with other people. And uh, one of them in particular has taken off. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of views <laughs> later. Here it seems to, it, every couple of months it goes viral again. It seems to be on a bit of an up again yeah. right now. I'm seeing comments and likes just out of nowhere. Nice. <laughs> well, let's have a look. This is the shenanigans of Le Canard Chantant at Avalok. So Before we end the session tonight, I, I'd, I'd like to ask you what's, you know, what other projects that you can direct our, our viewers to, where they can find more of your music or what do you have coming up? Robin, I'll ask you to start yeah, that answer. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we like, you know, I think every other ensemble of musicians around the world right now, we're certainly 
heavily impacted by the pandemic. So we had a lot of concerts lined up for spring and this coming autumn season that are either canceled or postponed or, or still just uncertain. So um, we actually haven't been together for a while. Um, however, we do have a couple of recordings in the works, one that we actually laid down in January right before everything exploded and we look forward to um, to bringing that out soon. Um, that's a recording of some music by Leonhard Lechner. And uh, we also are in the process of planning a recording in collaboration with another instrumental ensemble, um, Parthenia Viles. So those are a couple of things that um, I can't give you a release date yet, but we do have coming up in the future. And, and of course, uh, this program we've been talking about, Sex, Drugs and Madrigals, uh, will be back. And um, we don't know exactly when or where, but if you keep an eye on our website, we'll make sure that you can find it when it happens. Yeah, you can find that website information in the description below this video. So we have one last clip to share. Yeah, this is um, not so much a single, a single piece from the program, but actually more of a trailer for it. I found myself unable to choose a representative piece because the whole point of this program was to take you on such a, an emotional journey through the late Italian magical repertoire. So um, this, this final video will give you a, a sampler of um, the different pieces on the program, a bunch of different composers and the different theatrical approaches that um, we first explored and helped to gel at Avalox. So I hope you enjoy that and hopefully it piques your interest and we'll see you at a live performance sometime in the future. Con la musica di Letta, sovente le orecchie delle giovani, mollifica l'animo da ogni lascivia, ruina i costumi, disperde l'onestà, infiamma l'alme di cogente amore, incende i spiriti di concupiscenza carnale. cantano lamenti, disperazione, frottole, stanze, terzetti, canzoni, villanelle, barzellette. Si tocca la cetra o il liuto a battaglia amorosa. ai balli e alle danze dove i tatti vanno in volta i baci si sanno avanti le parole secrete stringere ascoso delle mani e ritirarsi qualche volta al buio a fatti vergognosi ed enormi. These men come down here from New York and from Florida to find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. <laughs> Ah, 
No, no, And I 100% believe it. And why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I know of the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. the lost position that you get into in the beat. Well, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what is about rock and roll music that they like, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. look forward to seeing that program when it comes and we look forward to hopefully inviting you all back to Avalok sometime soon. Um, again, all the information about Les Canards Chantants is in the description, their website and other links. But thank you, Richard, Eric, Jacob, Robin and Graham for, for sharing your music with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Really nice to connect. Thank you.